Hello and welcome to Immunology The War Is Over Episode 1, The Thymus Academy and Its T-Cell Cadets. Over the course of this series, we are going to be immersing ourselves in the immune system. And whilst conventional teaching usually starts with the innate immune system, followed by the adaptive immune system, we are going to be doing things slightly differently and kicking off our journey with T-cells. And in this episode, we'll be taking a look at the place where T-cells learn how to be T-cells, right here in the thymus. The thymus is where baby T-cells become mature T-cells and the training is rigorous and unforgiving. Quite literally, if a T-cell doesn't have what it takes to become a good T-cell, it will be destroyed. There are no other career paths, no second chances, just imminent death. And that means that any T-cell which makes it out of the thymus in one piece is a creme de la creme kind of T-cell. These are highly capable and ready to excel in their immune functions. Now, we'll be coming back to T-cells and their amazing abilities in episode two, but for now, let's go behind the scenes at the Thymus Academy. We're going to see just how brutal T-cell training can be. The thymus is regarded as primary lymphoid tissue because it's involved in nurturing and developing immune cells. The other primary lymphoid tissue is, of course, the bone marrow. Now, the thymus was so named because someone, at some point in history, thought it looked a little bit like a thyme leaf. You know, as in rosemary and thyme, the herbs. Personally, I'm less convinced, but then again, it's not up to me. And so that is the story of how the thymus came to be known as the thymus. So if you can imagine a little organ that sits just under the sternum and has a leaf-like quality, you have the thymus pretty much pictured in your mind. Now let's divide that thymus into two parts, the cortex around the outside and the medulla in the middle. The cortex is where immature T-cells first land when they arrive from the bone marrow. Here, they will undergo early phases of development and testing before they are permitted to enter the medulla where more advanced testing and selection occurs. And as rigorous as these selection processes can be, the curriculum here in the Thymus Academy is actually refreshingly simple. Ultimately, the thymus is only looking for two things in a T-cell. Number one, communication skills. The ability of the T-cell to communicate with other body cells about antigens that they've found sitting around the place. And this is tested in the cortex. And the second requirement is the ability to respond to foreign antigens whilst not overreacting to self-antigens. And this is tested in the medulla. So let's take a look now at how T-cells develop these core skills. First up, developing those communication skills in the cortex. The very first thing that happens to T-cells when they first arrive in the cortex is the installation of a communication device known as the T-cell receptor. This T-cell receptor is the place where antigens are presented to T-cells by other cells. It's literally the only place on the T-cell that this will happen and as such, it needs to be in working order. The T-cell receptor is designed to recognise not just antigens, but antigens that are presented by MHC molecules, or major histocompatibility complex molecules. So T-cell receptors are like docking stations for the MHC antigen complex, designed to recognise the whole package, not just the antigen itself. So when an antigen is found around the body, it will be broken down into peptide fragments and these fragments will be loaded onto the MHC molecules so they can be presented to T-cells. And there are two major categories of MHC, MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1 are present on all nucleated cells and are recognised by CD8 T-cells or cytotoxic T-cells whilst MHC2 are mainly present on antigen-presenting cells such as dendritic cells, B cells and macrophages. And these are recognised by CD4 T cells, also known as T helper cells. 
So the T-cell receptor is a communication device which is added to T-cells in the thymus and is designed to recognise the MHC antigen complex. It's going to recognise the whole thing as a package, but it also has to understand that the MHC component is a friendly player, someone on the same team. Now what's cool is that every single T-cell in our body has a unique T-cell receptor, and this is a very deliberate move by Mother Nature. If every T-cell has a slightly different T-cell receptor, it maximizes the number of antigens that we can recognize as foreign. If, on the other hand, every T-cell receptor was the same, then we could identify only one single antigen, which is clearly not ideal if we are going to survive in our microbe-rich environment. So, There is a standardized part of the T-cell receptor, but the part of the T-cell receptor which binds to the antigen is entirely unique. And we each produce around 100 million unique T-cell receptors. That's 10 to the 8, 100 million. And the way we do this is by taking a set of genes which code for this part of the T-cell receptor, and we rearrange those genes into various combinations in order to create a whole series of molecules that are slightly different. But you can imagine how random this is, right? The way to create all of these unique T-cell receptors is by jumbling up a set of genes, making random proteins, and then chucking those proteins onto the T-cell receptor. This indeed makes the receptor unique, but it in no way guarantees its function and its ability to bind to those MHC antigen complexes. And so once this unique T-cell receptor is added to the T-cell, it must be tested for functionality. Now eventually the T-cell receptor will bind to the MHC antigen complex, but we first just want to check that it can bind to MHC at all. If it does bind to MHC, then that's a great start. The T-cell is able to communicate with its co-workers around the body. And the T-cell can then progress to the next stage of training where we assess how it behaves around antigens. But before the T-cell moves on to the next stage, the thymus acknowledges the T-cell's unique talents with a badge of honour. If a T-cell has a natural affinity for MHC1 molecules, then that T-cell is best suited to becoming a cytotoxic T-cell and is awarded a CD8 marker on its surface. Likewise, if a T-cell was good at binding to MHC2 molecules, then that T-cell will receive a CD4 marker on its surface and is destined to be a T-helper cell. And this process of making sure that T-cells can bind to MHC molecules and then awarding them for their natural talents in this regard is known as positive selection. In a way, we can relate to this, right? When we were very young, in those early school years, our natural talents were relevant and applauded. We got to show up and have fun, and somehow that was enough. Contrast this with what happened later in our education, where natural talents become somewhat irrelevant to our employment prospects, and instead commitment to achieving the highest test scores is the only way forward. And suddenly, we start to feel the intensity of the second stage of T-cell education, which occurs in the medulla. Welcome to the medulla, where things are about to get brutal in a process known as negative selection. So T-cells coming into the medulla have those basic communication skills sorted. They have a functional T-cell receptor that can bind to MHC1 or 2, and they have been designated as a CD4 or CD8 T-cell according to their natural affinity for these MHC molecules. Now, the medulla focuses on the second part of the selection process, making sure that these T-cells react only to foreign antigens and not to self-antigens. And what happens here, as brutal as it sounds, will blow your mind. The thymus has this specialised epithelium known as thymic epithelial cells or TECs. And these are assisted by various antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, B cells, and macrophages. Thymic epithelium has the ability to test T cells against thousands of self-antigens. So molecules expressed by various tissues around the body are generated right here in the thymus and they are shown to the T cells. And these are known as tissue-restricted antigens, or TRAs. 
And the reason the thymus can do this is because of specialized transcription regulator genes. One of the most famous transcription regulator genes is known as AIR, autoimmune regulator gene. It does exactly what it says on the tin. It fends off autoimmunity. AIR is responsible for helping the thymic epithelium show T-cells things like insulin and casein, among others. Mutations in AIR typically lead to a condition known as autoimmune polyglandular syndrome, but can also lead to autoimmune disease affecting non-endocrine tissues as well. But whilst it may be the most famous, AIR is not the only transcription regulator gene. There are many, many more, and their various roles in health and disease are yet to be fully delineated. So essentially, in the medulla, the T-cells are undergoing simulation training. They are being presented with lots of self-antigens, and their response to these antigens will determine their very survival. If a T-cell demonstrates autoreactivity, it will be destroyed. But equally, if a T-cell shows blatant disinterest, not sussing out any antigens at all, then it too will be destroyed. And I'm going to tell you, the vast majority of T-cells, 95% of T-cells, do not make it out of the thymus alive. But the small percentage of T-cells who do survive this process are those creme de la creme kind of T-cells who demonstrate the ability to bind to foreign antigens but not overreact to self-antigens. Now, just to give you an idea of the timeline of all this, this process in the thymus happens in utero. So by the time we are born, our T-cells have already undergone this process and have released naive T-cells into our secondary lymphoid tissue, such as lymph nodes and our spleen. From there, our thymus, having done most of its work already, starts to shrink, becoming smaller and smaller as we age. It still functions, but it's smaller. So if you removed the thymus at birth, you would still have functional CD4 and CD8 T-cells. Okay, so let's quickly recap on what we learned here during our time in the Thymus Academy. T-cells arrive from the bone marrow to the cortex of the thymus. Here, a unique T-cell receptor is added to each and every T-cell. This T-cell receptor is then tested to see if it binds to MHC1 or MHC2. If it can do this successfully, the T-cell will have demonstrated the basic communication skills it needs to progress to the medulla. But just before leaving the cortex, the T-cell is awarded a CD4 or CD8 badge of honour, depending on its natural affinity for the different MHC molecules. And this whole process is known as positive selection. Now the T-cells enter the medulla, where they undergo brutal simulation training against thousands of self-antigens. T-cells, which can bind to antigens but not overreact to self-antigens, get to survive, whilst all other T-cells are unapologetically destroyed. Only the creme de la creme T-cells graduate from the Thymus Academy and live on in our secondary lymphoid tissues. By design, this whole process allows our T-cells to protect us from infection while safeguarding us against autoimmune disease. And these T-cells that leave the thymus are known as naive T-cells because although they are highly trained and ready for action, they've never actually seen their corresponding antigen before. So what happens to naive T-cells after they leave the thymus and then later come across their specific antigen? We'll be covering exactly that in episode two. I'll see you in there.